type of fellowship you have with God? Is it how God designed it to be? Because he's looking, he wants you back at every time. He wants to have that fellowship with you. But there are many things happening around, rushing, you know, like, like uh, the, said the scripture we read, said the world rushes on, the, uh, sorry, the um, congressional song, the world rushes on. So a lot of activities here and there, but you don't need all of those activities, all of those things you are pursuing, pursuing you don't need all of them. You see, we have a lot here, material things, pursuit, maybe academic, career, here and there, but at the end of life's day, you think, what do you really need? You see that many of these things, almost everything you are pursuing, you don't even need all these things. It is the fellowship, the life, your life with God, that is what matters at the end of life's day. Because have everything at the time the bread ceases, all those beautiful things you think you have acquired, you go with nothing, nothing, zero. No matter how much you have in wealth, in monetary wealth, material wealth, you go with nothing. No matter how many degrees you have on this side of life, you go with nothing, none of those things matter at all at the end of life's day. So look at it and think, what is really the most important thing? And that's why Jesus Christ told Martha, he said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful, thou art troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. One thing is needful. He says, Mary had chosen that important part which shall not be taken away from her. And I pray that God will help us that we set our priorities right and we know what is right to pursue. Yes, those things are good. Maybe you have wealth, you'll be comfortable on this side of life, but... You never neglect the most important thing, your life with God. And that's why God is calling us this morning to come back to a life of fellowship. Spend much time in secret. Spend much time with God. Spend time with the Word of God. And that is how you can gain the real world, the things that matter. You see, when God commissioned uh, uh, Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, he says, This book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest uh, observe to do according to all that is written therein, for in them thou shalt have good success. And I pray that God will help us as we pursue success. We look for that good success. We look for that balance and make sure your spiritual life is not neglected. Make sure you are rich and wealthy in the Lord, in the things that matter. That fellowship, you must have it. That fellowship, God wants you to be preserved, and God will help everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. So for Adam and Eve, they heard the voice of the Lord God uh, walking in the garden, the cool of the day. Psalm chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, it says, Lord, that's the psalmist, he asked God a very important question. He says, who may abide? Who shall abide in, the, in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Because the thing that really matters, the life with God, who is going to ascend at the end of life's day? What is the qualification for you to make heaven at the end of life's day? And then God answered him in verse 2. He says, they that, uh, he that worketh uprightly and worketh righteousness, and speak at the truth in his heart. So a righteous life, a life of walking with God, a life of putting God first, a life of walking in the word of God. That is how we are going to make it at the end of life's day. I pray God will help us to be wise and not foolish in Jesus' name. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible tells us there uh, regarding what uh, God expects from us. Blessed is he that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of discomfort. So, three things. You walk not in the counsel. They are not, the, the ungodly are not your counselors. You know, to be able to really walk with God and follow God and have that fellowship that when God comes, as, you know, he will see you ready, he will see your heart prepare, a life that works with God. He says, you walk not in their counsel. So you're not following the counsel 
of the ungodly, how you deal with, your, with things around you, with your parents, with your children, with your wife. You're not going to the internet and say, how do I do this? How do I do this? About your own life. You see, those people there, they may be divorces. Those people there, they may be, you know, worldly people. And yes, you get some answers, but about life matters. That is very, very important. You get life from the creator of life, from God who formed you. And you can have it from the word of God, instructions from God. So you walk not in their counsel, and you are not standing in the way of the sinners. Always around them, there are people around you, people you hear from. Those are not uh, your, you know, where you belong. Yes, you cannot remove yourself completely because you go to school and all that, but working with them, your friends, people that hang around with you, always, they are not the people, so you walk not in their counsel, their instructions, you are not uh, hanging around them, and then you are not sitting in the seat of the scornful. You take part in their jokes and in their, you know, their, the, 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 the kind of things they say are what you say, that is not for a Christian. That is not what God expects from someone who we will fellowship with. I pray that God will help us to walk with God, to listen to God, that the book of the law will not depart out of our mouths. You have to create time, read the word of God, create time, fellowship with God in prayer, spend much time in secret, and God will help you. God will keep your heart ready. And when you pray, heaven will be opened. God will grant answers to your prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Question number one, it says, what is the primary purpose of God for creating man? Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, just like you mentioned, um, the number one purpose for God creating man to have fellowship with him. Also, there are others which includes to cultivate the garden, which means as Christians, we are expected to work and provide for our families. Um, the third reason is to be fruitful and multiply, which also includes having children. And the fourth and final one is to have domain over everything on. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Yes, you hit the first, you know, the very important, most important thing is to have, in fact, that's the number one thing that matters really. That's the main thing that matters, to have fellowship with God to, you know. So every other thing is to support your life here on earth, to make you comfortable here. But at the end of life's day, no matter how many children you have, no matter how, how much food you have stocked in the store, no matter how much money, you know, you have in the bank, in, even in cash in hand, everything, none of those, none of those things matter. Your degree, none of those things matter if you are poor, Nothing matters again, your life with God. So I pray God will help us, will be wise and not foolish in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to look at point number one, the thoughtlessness of a sinful man. The thoughtlessness of a sinful man. For Adam and Eve, they were thoughtless because they listened to the voice of the devil. They listened to the serpent speaking and suggesting those uh, evil things, those bad things, instead of listening to God's instruction. They were deliberating with the devil, you know, negotiating with him. But you will not negotiate with Satan, you will not negotiate with the world, you really go back and check up what does God say concerning this, always, in every matter, and that is how you will be successful, in this life and fellowship with God, and God will help you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Adam and Eve, they failed, and God looked at even man. After Adam and Eve, they were going down and down. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, God looked at man and, you know, looked at the life of man. He says the thought of his evil, the thought of his heart was evil continually, only evil continually, and it repented God that he made man. Psalm chapter 53, verse 2 and 3. It says, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, 
No, not one. And that is why God is calling, seeking for those who are ready, those who are ready to you know, fellowship with him. He wants to have your heart. He wants you to come back to him. There are many distractions around here. You know, social media and many other things, social media especially takes many youths away. They are engaged, engaged. When you're engaged there, you know, hours upon hours, every day of the week, what time do you have? Your soul is dry. You no, know, the word of God, because those things are the things that will come back to you when it's time to decide. But the Bible says that shall meditate therein. The word of God says this, uh, uh, that the scripture, or that the word of God, so this book of the Lord, that's what the Bible calls it. This book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate upon it day and night. You fill your heart with the word of God. Psalms 119, verse 9. It says, Where with that shall a young man cleanse his ways? How will you cleanse your way? How will you cleanse your heart? It's by taking heed thereto, according to the word of God. He said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So you need to be full of the word of the word of God, not with the world. But in all those internet, all those sites, you, are, you know, people are looking at, fortunately, they are full of the world. But the world will take people to hell, but you have to set yourself apart and seek God. Yes, you use all those uh, devices, you know, to improve your life and improve your career and improve, you know, your learning and all that. Good. But then, you have to be rich in the word of God so that when times for decision that happens every day come, you will act wisely and you will work, act unto the word of God. And God will keep you holy and righteous and in good fellowship with God in Jesus' name. Amen. And God, God said to Adam and Eve, he said, where art thou? So God is calling you, where art thou? Where, do you be, where are you standing? He wants to have that fellowship daily. Every time with you, your heart must be ready. At every point in time you call on him, yes, he answers, yes, he knows you are in tune with him, and he will hear you. Amen. So many forsake the fellowship of believers. They reject the word of God. They follow the evil imaginations of the thoughts of their heart. Instead of following the word of God and the guidance of God, they engage in pornography, watch corrupt films, listen to ungodly music, which pollute their minds and propel them to engage in evil doings. This makes it difficult for them to turn away from their evil deeds. Often, sinning youths do not bother to think about the consequence of their steps, just like Adam and Eve did not, uh, you know, they were senseless, they were not reasonable, they were thoughtless, they just followed the suggestions of the devil. You will not engage with the devil, you will not deliberate with him regarding the things of your life. You will rather follow the word of God. Remember always to ask yourself, what does God say about this? What does God want me to do? And then you also listen to your godly parents that have experience working with God. Listen to their counsel. Don't think you know it, you know it, you know it. And then you're even arguing, uh, you know, arguing as if you know, you know, probably things you learn from other youths or from school. You have to guide that. You be guided according to the word of God. Listen to your godly parents and listen to instruction. And God will keep you in, in, standing in him in Jesus' name. Amen. Question number two, why did Adam and Eve yield to the suggestions of the devil? Why did Adam and Eve yield to the suggestions of the devil? Yes, someone help us, please. Yes, I just it again. Okay, thank you. Because of their thoughtlessness and lack of closeness to God. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, you are thoughtless and you are not close to God. God expected them to be ready to be fellowshipping with Him. There has to be in tune with him. That instruction he gave them, that shall not eat of this, that shall not eat. He expect them to keep it in their heart so that they'll be guided by it. But they, you know, when the time for decision came, they, rather, they, they even forgot about that and they were negotiating with the devil. You will not negotiate with the devil in Jesus' name. Amen. Question number three. Mention some young men in the scripture who followed the evil imaginations of their hearts. So young men in the scriptures who followed evil imaginations of their hearts. 
Okay, for our time, I will just uh, go on. We see Ammon, uh, who, who raped uh, his sister, was following his heart. You know, those things, that thing was evil. Instead of going to God in prayer and let that thing die away, God to cleanse his heart, he continued deliberating and he was asking even ungodly friend. You know, that's why he fell. So those people should not be your friend. They should not be your counselors. They should not be your counselors if you want to succeed in life. Remember, those things do not, they're not, you don't have any profit. From last week's study, immorality makes you powerless. It's a sale of your birthright. So anything like that, anything of the world, do not meditate on it. Rather, go to God in prayer and let that evil thought go away. Let, that, let God cleanse your heart so that he will bring you back. So always remember prayer. We are in trouble. You see that things are not right. Go to God in prayer and allow God cry before him. You see he will wash that evil thought away and you will be back in fellowship with him. Pray God will help us in Jesus' name. So Amnon is there. Also Absalom who betrayed his father is one of them. Then uh, one that listened to ungodly friends, uh, the son of Solomon, Rehoboam, he was listening to those uh, youths that don't know anything and said, my father chastised you with whip, I'm going to chastise you with scorpion. And that's how God removed the other kingdoms from him and he ruled over just two tribes in Israel. God will help us, we'll listen to the words of the wise, the words of instruction, the words of our godly parents, and we'll be guided by the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number two, the truthfulness of a saved life. The truthfulness of a saved life. John chapter 14, verse 6, the Bible said, that Jesus said unto uh, him, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus is the way to salvation. You see yourself, you have not given your life to Jesus. You have to repent of your sins and seek God, confess of those sins and and ask God for forgiveness, he will cleanse you and make you whole. So Jesus is the way. Salvation is what you need. You need salvation to be in fellowship with God. Without salvation, you cannot be in true fellowship with God. Fellowship with God is not coming to church every Sunday. We're talking of a life of work with God. We are many here, but how many people are, not everyone in the church, are in good state with God? You know, look at your life with God. How is your life with God? How are you working with God? How are you working with other people? What's your relationship? Are you listening to the word of God? Are you living your life as a Christian? Or you live whatever you want to live on Sunday, you want to come and think uh, everything is okay? It's not by coming every Sunday. Yes, as a Christian, you need to be here every Sunday, but it's more than Sunday. Sunday worship is a life, life, a kind of living with God. Day to day, he regulates your life. He guides your decisions. God will make us wise in Jesus' name. Question number four, what must a sinner do to be saved? What must a sinner do to be saved? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. First, the sinner must acknowledge that he is a sinner and accept the gift that Christ has given on the cross of Calvary. We pray about it, repent, and turn away from sins. Thank you very much. God bless you. Yeah. Point number three, because our time is up. Transformation through fellowship with God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In verse 2, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, your heart has to be renewed. Your mind has to be renewed by the word of God. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So God needs us to be transformed, transformation through fellowship with God. So the more of God you, you get in your, in, your, in your life, the more of the word you get, you imbibe, you eat in, uh, you know, in, in your life. As I said, I've found the word, I've ate it. So you need to dwell, you need to be rich in the word of God. Your life has to be full of the word of God for you to be successful. God has to lead 
every step of your, you know, you have to ask him. Let him be your guide. Let him be your Lord. Let him be your counselor. And that is how you will succeed in your journey and life with God. So the, the blessings, the benefits of working with God, of fellowship with God, they include restoration, deliverance, joy, peace, and grace to serve the Lord. So God gives you the grace. God helps you to serve the Lord. Remember, by the time you repent, he gives you the power to become the son, the daughter of God. That we see in John chapter 1, verse 12. So God will help you as you take that decision to serve God. You know that everything is not right with you, and you seek God in prayer. You go to him and confess your sins and tell him, Lord, have mercy on me. Yes, he will have mercy on you. He will he will, give, he will save you, he will pardon you of those sins, and he will give you power to become the son and daughter of God. That power you need in your day-to-day life to be successful, to be victor- victorious over the devil, over the world, over sin, and God will help every one of us who will make it. You'll be triumphant in this life, you'll be victorious in this life, walk with God. At the end of life's day, yes, you'll be victorious and you'll make heaven at last, and that is our goal. We will make it in Jesus' name. So let us go to God in prayer and commit ourselves to the hands of God. We've heard the word of God. Yes, the thing that matters, one thing is needful. Just one thing is needful. And that is your work with God, your fellowship with God. How is your life with God? How is your work with God? A Christian life is more than wealth. Yes, God blesses you. A Christian life is more than, you know, education. These are things that they are not even, they don't matter at the end of the day. Commit yourself to the hands of God and tell God that thing that matters, that thing that is needful. Help me. I will seek you. I will follow you. I will have that thing, that one thing in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we are grateful unto you. We thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we ask, oh God, that Lord, you will help us, oh God. Help us, O God, give us, O God, Lord, wisdom that we will follow, we will make our priorities right, and we will take you, we will put you first in everything we do. Our fellowship will be rich with you in the name of Jesus. Thank you because we know you've answered. I pray for as many who have looked at their lives and they know that everything is not right in their life. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you will forgive those sins that are confessed this morning in the name of Jesus. I restore every sinner back to you, back to fellowship with you in Jesus' name. Help every one of us, O oh God, where we are dry. Lord, your spirit, O oh God, will fill us, O oh God. Your spirit, O oh God, will, will bring us back to what you have designed it to be, especially fellowshipping with you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. reminds us of the things we know before but sometimes we be fast forgetting but it's merciful to always bring this to our remembrance he has told us the importance of having the conditions of fellowship with him let us just be in that mood of prayer that God will help us to be in constant fellowship with him and every time we get we meet with him he will be here to bless us in Jesus name we're here now to worship the name of the Lord. And we know that his uh, miss is here to bless us. He's here to bless you and me. And as we have come, we'll be glad because we came. Let's open our hearts to him that as we have come, We'll be blessed because we came. We've come to see God, not man. And because we're gathered, we'll be blessed because we came. Mm -hmm. As we gather, Father, may your spirit dwell within us. 
As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing that as our heart begins to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came as we gather. As we gather, may your spirit dwell within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. Yeah, we'll be blessed because we came as we gather as we gather may your spirit dwell within us we ask for your spirit oh lord as we gather may we glorify your name knowing well that as a high begins to worship we'll be blessed because we came we'll be blessed because we came as we gather may your spirit dwell within us as we gather Glorify your name, knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. I adore you. I lay my life before you. How I love you, Father.
Higher. We'll praise him from the depth of our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Just from the depth of your heart, worship God this morning. Amen. He has done great things and we'll keep thanking him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, now we give you praise. There is no like unto thee, Lord, not to be compared with you. You've done great things in our lives, and we are here to thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. What shall we say unto the Lord? All we have to say is thank you, Lord. What shall we say unto the Lord? All we have to say is thank you. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord of my 
my soul this is the day he has made hallelujah hallelujah praise ye the lord praise ye the lord praise ye the lord of oh my soul this is the day he has made hallelujah hallelujah praise ye the lord praise ye the lord of oh my soul this is the day he had made hallelujah Worship him and magnify his great and marvelous name. And we continue to walk in his presence and receive the blessings as we continue. God will continue to re reward us and lavish his goodness upon us in Jesus. Our Lord, are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only, and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a wharf any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? 
For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. In a race.
few mercies, mighty hoses still are rain. I feel grown faint hearted in the fearful prey. Do the pass of evil seem to gain the day? Faith will win the victory every time. blessing there's freedom there's deliverance and there is blessing overflowing from heaven and we pray lord everyone at the worship service today everywhere will experience a divine touch and supernatural freedom in jesus name Amen. confirm your blessing upon every life in jesus name we pray 
Another amen before you sit down. God bless you. You can sit down. Today we're coming to Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 7. Exodus chapter 3. We're reading from verse 7. It says, And the Lord said, And the Lord said, And what the Lord said then, is still saying today. Because it says, I am God, I change not. And the Lord said, And the Lord says, I have seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry. God has heard your cry. God has seen your tears and your wife, all the tears away in Jesus' name. They are crying by the reason of their taskmasters, for I know, I know, I know their sorrows. Now he tells us in verse 8, in verse 8 he says, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. You are going to a better place. I said we're going to a better place. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Out of Egypt. Today, you are out. Out of every dungeon out of every bondage, out of every calamity that has followed you until this day. By the time you enter the middle of this week, a new month, new life, new joy, new achievement, because the Lord is bringing you out of and is going to bring you into the land flowing with milk and honey. I receive. Look at Exodus chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 13. Exodus chapter 6, verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron. He spake unto Moses. Now, he had spoken unto Moses before. Aaron now joined. And the message remains the same. Moses started, Aaron joined on to project, to proclaim, to declare, and to emphasize the same message that had been given to Moses. We started, and God gave us the message, bring them out, take them through, bring them in, and Aaron may join. An overseer may join. A national overseer, region overseer, state overseer may join. A minister may join. When you join, as Aaron joined Moses, the same declaration and the same word, the Lord now said, he gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh king of Egypt. Bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. There is uh, no alteration. There is no modification. And there is no change. The same message given originally out and then in. That same message the Lord is still giving today. And any preacher that follows after the foundation that we have laid must understand you come in to emphasize to preach to proclaim to declare that same message out of the world out of sin out of darkness into the glorious light of the gospel look at verse 26 in verse 26 
these are that Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. We're here all through this time, the crusade time, the worship time, the teaching time for supernatural freedom. I am here for supernatural freedom. How about you? How about you? Declare that out aloud. I am here for supernatural freedom. If you have not got it, you'll get it right now. The topic today now is supernatural freedom through scriptural faith. Think about that. Supernatural freedom, scriptural faith, they go together. And it is the foundation of that, in the fountain of that, in the fortress we have, that with scriptural faith in the Lord, everyone will have supernatural freedom. We're looking at this on the three perspectives. Number one, number one, the foundation of supernatural supernatural freedom through faith everything through faith number two the fountain of sufficient fullness through faith and number three the fortress of steadfast fortitude steadfast fortitude by faith number one through faith Number two, through faith. Number three, through faith. We're coming to number one now. Number one, the foundation. What could you build without foundation? Where could you go without foundation? What could you have without foundation? We need the foundation. And from the very beginning, the Lord set the foundation. Even in creating the world, you have the foundations. And if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Number one, the foundation of supernatural freedom through faith. We're looking at Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, all the idols, all the superstition of Egypt, when I execute judgment, I am the Lord. And then he tells us in verse 13, in verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a sign, for a token, upon the houses where ye dwell, where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. That's the foundation. They have to go through the blood. They have to be under the cover of the blood. They have to be under the covenant of the blood. They have to add the cleansing and the covering of the blood. And it is the foundation. Whatever we get later, the blood of the Lamb is the foundation. The sacrifice of Christ is the foundation. The sacrifice at Calvary and what Jesus did at the final sacrifice as a substitute, as our salvation, our Savior, that is the foundation of everything we have, the foundation of supernatural freedom through faith. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one is the peace and the pardon through saving faith. Saving faith. The faith that saves. The faith that gets us out of darkness into the light. Pardon and peace through saving faith. Number two, Purging and purity through sanctifying faith. Faith 
It's many sided. It's like the diamond. You look at it this side, you see the salvation. And then you look at that that side, you see the sanctification. And then you look at it another direction, and it's putting you into the strength in the power of the Holy Ghost. Number one is the pardon and the peace through saving faith. Number two, purging and purity through sanctified faith. Number three, possession of power. Power through strengthening our faith. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're talking about the pardon and the peace through saving our faith. When you come to the Lord, turning away from your sin, and you remove yourself, you remove your hand, you remove your mouth, you remove your eyes, you remove your ears, you remove your feet, you remove your personality, you remove your totality out of sin, and you turn your back against sin. That's when the pardon of God and the peace of God comes to you. Look at this, Luke chapter 7. We're looking at verse 47. It says, Wherefore I say unto thee, as sins which are many are forgiven. This is the woman that came to Jesus Christ, the burden of her sin, the conviction of her sin, the heavy load and guilt of her sin broke her down. And she began to weep. And tears were coming out. And the Pharisee was saying, look at this, if Jesus had been a prophet, he would have known that this woman was a sinner. Yes, a sinner. That's why she was crying. A sinner. That's why she was weeping. A sinner. That's why the heart was broken. A sinner. That's why she was turning away and in her tears saying, I made a mess of my life in the past and I want a turning around. And she cried and Jesus Jesus said, as sins which are many are all forgiven. Look at verse 50. In verse 50, it tells us, and he said unto the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Saving faith, saving faith. Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Forgiven, set free. Her faith set her free. She had pardon and peace pardon and then the peace of god settled in her heart when you come to the lord like that that's how you know you are saved your pardon and then the peace of god settles in your heart by looking at romans chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 1 romans chapter 5 and we're reading here from verse 1 therefore be justified by by faith our argument cannot justify us you go to the court of law and then you argue you argue i am free i'm free your argument cannot justify you your lawyer that says yes my client is free his argument cannot set you free it's when you come in repentance i bring no other plea i have no argument i look at the cross and i see jesus christ who died for me i was the guilty one i was the one that couldn't pay the price of my guilt and condemnation but he on the cross died for me no other plea but that Christ died for me. And then you are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2 there. In verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith. By faith. All by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now you are headed for glory. Disgrace is gone. Condemnation is gone. You are pardoned. You are set free. You are forgiven. And the peace of God coming from the throne of the Prince of Peace now comes in your heart. We have pardon and we have peace through saving faith. Look at number two here. Number two here. We're
were looking at purging and purity through sanctifying faith. Sanctifying faith. You know, some people do not understand. They think faith is only for healing, healing. Yes, of course. They think faith is only for deliverance, deliverance. Yes, of course. But faith is for sanctification. Faith is for the purging of the heart. Faith is for the purity of the heart. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 9. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. And he put no difference between us and them between the Jews and the Gentiles, between the apostles and the disciples. He put no difference between us and them, between the minister and the member. You know, there are people that think that sanctification is only for ministers, only for the apostles. Well, water drinking is not only for the minister, for the minister and for the member. Water drinking, the water of life, and the water that washes and cleanses us and purges the heart and purges the soul that brings holiness into the heart of man. And the water is not for only the ministers, it's for the members, not only for the apostles, it's for disciples, not only for the men, it's for the women, not only for the old, it's for the young. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, when it says purifying, there was a time Elisha was at Jericho. And the people of Jericho came to him and they said, The land appears good, beautiful. But they said, The water is not because there is poison in the water. And then he said, bring me a cruise of salt and threw to the very source and the water was healed. The water was purified. It's a picture of the man that he looks beautiful on the outside. I am saved. I have peace. I have pardon. And then when you look at the outward life, true, gentleness has come. Humbleness of mind has come. Everything on the outside looks very very well, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You see something coming out to say, the heart is not. The heart is not pure. And you see the actions that come out of the heart. You see, the, the man looks uh, gentle, and the woman looks gentle, and looks somewhere, but the thing coming out of the very source of his life is not. And then Christ touches that heart, purges that heart, and purifies that heart as you come. And you come with this level of faith, saving faith, your heart at salvation, sanctifying faith, you now have at the point of sanctification. He purges you and he purifies you, purifying their hearts by faith. Look at um, Acts chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 26, verse 18, to open their eyes. Was he talking of physically blind people? No. He was talking of people that read Isaiah chapter 53, and he didn't see Jesus there. He was talking about people that read the Exodus chapter 12, and they didn't see Jesus, the Lamb of God, that they were blind. And they read Psalm 2, and they saw that the Father, the God of heaven, spoke to his Son. They didn't see Jesus in the scriptures. Now tell me, Philip, who is this scripture talking about? Is he talking about himself, or is he talking about another one? And Philip opened his mouth at that time, at that point, and from that scripture preached unto him, Jesus. There are people that read their Bible, they don't see Jesus, our sanctifier. There are people that read the Bible from cover to cover, they 
see Jesus Christ as the purifier and the refiner of the soul, as the one that will transform us inside out, outside and inside. And so God sent Paul the apostle go and open their eyes. And as you open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive, look at this, number one, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and number two, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Christ sanctified by faith the faith of the person talking to him Christ was talking to him faith that is in me he sanctifies us he purifies us as we come up with sanctifying faith the faith that saves number one the faith that sanctifies number two and then we're set free set free and number one we're set free from the external sin from the branches of the tree producing sin in our life number two we're set free from the inner sin in what sin depravity it said us free supernaturally it tells us in the first Thessalonians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 22 first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 it says abstain from all appearance of evil you are pardoned you are peace with God things are different now since I came to Christ if any man be in Christ born again it says it's a new creature old things have passed away you don't think about them anymore you don't plan on them anymore you don't go that direction anymore even the appearance of evil abstain from all appearance of evil and then in verse 23 in verse 23 it says and the very God of peace sanctified. The very God of peace has given you peace at salvation, pardon at salvation. And now that very God that gives you peace at the point of salvation sanctify you holy. And I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can he do it? I said, can he do it? Look at verse 24. It says in verse 24, faithful is seed that calleth you. He called us to salvation. He did that. He calls us now unto holiness. He calls us unto purity. He calls us unto sanctification. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He'll do it in every heart. Peace and pardon, he'll do that. Purging and purity, he'll do that. Number three now, is the possession of power through strengthening faith. When faith comes, we're strengthened. There's something else. Fear weakens us. Fear blindfolds us. Fear takes away our mind. Fear makes us forget where we're coming from, where we are, and where we're going. Fear makes us to forget the purpose of our calling, makes us to forget the provision of Christ from Calvary. But when fear gives way and faith comes in, darkness will vanish away in your life. Ignorance will vanish away in your life. And that heart palpitation, and you're so afraid, can I pray? Can I go on? Can I seek the promise of God? Can I possess the promise of God? When faith comes, then that courage and that conviction that this is what God has provided, and I'm going to have, you will have. I will have. There is the possession 
of power through the strengthening of faith. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 16. Ephesians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 16. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man now weakness comes from the inner man the man looks large the man looks hefty the man looks great and is taller than the average person but the heart is weak and the heart is fearful and the heart is trembling the outer man looks terrific but the inner man is trembling that the reason why we see people who are supposed to be strong they're supposed to be great they're supposed to confront anything that comes against them because you look at them and you think their stature their physique their figure will be able to endure anything but the inner man needs to be strengthened and when the holy goes in power when it comes to you you are strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man look at verse 17 there verse 17 that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith the one that never lost any battle the one that overcame every temptation the one that overcame the devil and he said it is finished that he that conquering christ that mighty christ that christ that never lost any battle may dwell in your hearts by faith that she be rooted and grounded in love may may know all that god has provided acts chapter one we're looking at verse eight but he shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth unto the uttermost part of the earth and you see that there it started with in jerusalem in jerusalem that's where Christ was crucified. In Jerusalem, that's where the Pharisees upheld the tradition of the fathers against the gospel. And the disciples were so much afraid. They were saved. They were so much afraid. And they were behind closed doors. And then Christ came to them and said, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you into the world. World. But they didn't leave that room there. They were still in that inner chamber because they needed the power. You've got the pardon and the peace, good. You've got the purging and the purity, good. But if you're going to come, because unto the uttermost part of the earth, the uttermost part of the earth, the way the first century disciples were threatened and they were fearful, the same way the people in the uttermost part of the earth, the same way we're threatened, and they tell us, shut up, and they tell us, don't come here, and they tell us, don't talk about Christ and they uplift their tradition in the uttermost part of the world like those people uplifted their tradition and if they succeeded by the power of the Holy Ghost that is the only way we can succeed today and so it says you shall receive power I will receive power I said I will receive power you cannot even talk. Okay? When we're here, we're believers, no pursuit talk here. If you cannot say you'll get power while we're here and we're together in the fellowship, when you get to the territory of the enemy, how can you talk? We will receive power. It says he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come 
armor upon you. The weakest saint of God, the weakest child of God, when the power of the Holy Ghost comes, it will be turned to another man. It will have supernatural power to go and search other people free. Look at chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 8. Acts chapter 6, verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, when it says, and Stephen, full of faith, what does that mean? When you feel a bucket to the brim, and there is no space for another drop of any other thing full of faith. So full of faith, no drop of fear, no drop of timidity, no drop of apprehension. When the Lord comes to you and he makes you full of faith, the saving faith, the sanctifying faith, and the strengthening faith, and he makes you mighty and powerful, and there's no drop of fear in your heart, and then you look straight, you know, that's where I'm going, and the power of the Holy Ghost will propel you you will get there in Jesus' name. Look at uh, Luke chapter 24. We're reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power, until ye be endued with power, until he be overwhelmed, saturated with power from on high. But tarry, but tarry. The believers of nowadays, they no more tarry in the presence of the Lord. Once they hear the preaching, and then after the preaching, there's a little prayer. Immediately, they're running for the bus. They're running to their home. They're running on the road. They're, they might even be running you, you know, just talk, talk, talk among our people and tarrying in the presence of God that we will know it's only for the tarrying people, it's only for the faithful people, it's only for the people that understand I've got peace, I've got pardon, I need more, I've got purging, I've got purity, I need more I now need the possession of the power of God that will carry me through all the things I need to do in the service of soul winning and bringing people unto the Lord. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, the fountain of sufficient fullness through faith. The children of Israel on their journey. And as they were moving from Egypt through the Red Sea onto the land of the Amalekites and the wilderness, and they were going to get to the promised land. Uh, there was something that confronted them in the way. There was no water. And they needed a fountain of living waters that will satisfy all their thirst. Look at Exodus chapter 17. Exodus Chapter 17, and we're reading from verse 3 here. It says, And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle? What's well, first?